thank you all for coming tonight and joining us in the Grace Lecture Series as we wrap up the Fall 2012 presentations. Our featured speaker tonight is Dr. Norma Neely. She is a member of the Shatter State College Family and Consumer Science Faculty Department. And the title of her talk tonight is The Food Experiment, Us. As you can see, we do not have coffee and cookies tonight. Sorry, <laughs> we're having nutritious things tonight. So I don't get my coffee and cookies. So anyway, please join me in welcoming Dr. Norma Neely. Well, thank you, and um, I appreciate being asked to do this. And so tonight I'm going to try to share some things um, that I'm very much interested in, and so hopefully you'll have some things to contribute also to the discussion. Um, it is the food experiment, us. And, you know, we really are in the midst of um, an experiment to see what food does to us, and we have been forever. And so this is um, the idea of what, what is this experiment doing today? And so there are three topics that I'd like to talk about. The state of our health, what the research shows, and a diet to enhance our health. So first of all, the state of our health. Um, and I looked up, what are some diseases and conditions related to health today? And as far as cancer goes, there are 12 million Americans that have been diagnosed with cancer. Some were recently diagnosed, and some, excuse me, I'll move this over. Uh, some others were diagnosed years ago. So that's the total number. And then uh, heart disease. 16 million Americans currently have heart disease. 26 million Americans currently have diabetes. 46 million Americans currently have arthritis. And about 35% of Americans are overweight and about 33% are obese. And so two out of every three Americans way more than what a healthy weight would be. As far as deaths from disease, uh, the number of deaths per leading causes of death, this is 2008 data, and by the way, all of the stats in this come from either the Center, Center for Disease Control or um, the Arthritis Foundation or the American Cancer Society and so forth. I didn't put those all up here specifically, but that, that's where the data comes from. Um, so as you can see there, the leading causes of death in the United States are heart disease and cancer. And those are actually approximately half of the deaths in the United States are from those two particular things. Uh, deaths from cancer in 2008 uh, 567,000, and in 2012, it's predicted that it would be 577,000. Deaths from cancer are more than 1,500 people per day. Now, I was thinking, um, how many people can be seated on a 747 jet? What do you think? 300. 300? Okay. Other guesses? Well, I, okay, I looked it up because I didn't really know, mm -hmm. and generally it says, depending upon how the seats are configured, it could be 400 to 500 people on a 747 jet, which means that this would be like three 747 jets falling from the sky every day. If there were 500 people on board a 747, three of them falling from the sky every day. And that's nearly 2,000 jets crashing every year, just with people who die from cancer. If you add the deaths from heart disease, that's more than six 747 jets falling from the sky every day. According to the American Cancer Society, 1,638,000 Americans are expected to be diagnosed with cancer in 2012. If we put all those people on 747 jets, there would be 3,277 jets flying around with passengers wondering if their plane was going to crash, killing everyone on board. 
And that's only for the year 2012. That doesn't include those people diagnosed in 2011 or 2010 or et cetera. So our current health care system treats but does not prevent disease. We load all these people onto 747 jets as if there were no options. But maybe we should try to prevent people from getting on those planes. If there were a way to prevent disease, like cancer, heart disease, diabetes, wouldn't we be doing it? If we have three 747 jets falling to the ground every day, it seems like we could figure out a way to prevent some of that. So what the research shows, and this is part two, there's a lot of confusion, I think, about what research shows because one day there will be a research study come out about something and the media picks it up and it's big news. And then another day something else will come out about something else. And sometimes there are conflicting things. Um, and for an example, um, my sister one day, this was several years ago, uh, we were talking and she said yes. Yeah. She said um, a few days ago I heard the, on the news that uh, a, a glass of red wine a day um, helps lower the risk of heart disease. So she said, I decided I was going to drink one glass of red wine a day. She said, the next day I heard that even one, red, one glass of red wine per day increases the risk of breast cancer for women. <laughs> so she said, I decided to do away with the one glass of red wine a day. So, um, so the research can be confusing. Um, and the books that we're going to review tonight, and I brought them along, so if you want to look at them after the session or anything, you're welcome to. And also, um, there's a little piece of paper over there that has the books uh, listed there, if you care to check them out later. Um, but the books that we're reviewing tonight are all based on a multitude of studies. It's not just one study that said something, but the authors of these books looked at a whole variety of studies and came to some conclusions. So the first book is the China study. And I'll just tell you a little bit about uh, the author, first of all. Um, the author of the China study is T. Colin Campbell, uh, PhD. And um, he was raised on a dairy farm. And so he, he grew up in that environment uh, meat, potatoes, gravy, lots of dairy, of course, and so forth. And he went to uh, uh, pre-vet uh, school at Penn State. He's going to be a veterinarian. And he went to Cornell to do PhD work uh, in animal nutrition. And actually, I think that he received his PhD in animal nutrition there. And then he worked at MIT and he worked at Virginia Tech. So this is a guy with lots of credentials and highly sought after by a lot of the big schools. Um, when he was at Virginia Tech, um, he was doing research there and so forth and mainly with animals, but in some way he got connected um, there in the Philippines. There were a lot of children that were um, developing liver cancer. And so uh, he was one of the people that was determined should look at this and see what was going on. But the main thing was they wanted to be sure that the children of the Philippines had uh, plenty of protein because it was thought that they were developing cancer because they didn't have enough protein. And so he was the coordinator of a project uh, to see what was going on. And they set up uh, places around the Philippines and so forth where um, they could monitor and make sure that the children were getting that protein and so forth. And what they found was that the children that had the most protein were the ones developing the liver cancer. And so that wasn't what they were supposed to find. And this sort of started him looking at a lot of things about food and what food does in the body. Um, he started doing studies and um, a lot of studies with little rice, uh, little rice, mice and rats. And they looked a lot at protein. 
And what they began to discover was that um, when they limited the protein of these uh, mice, and they, and they injected a, a, a carcinogen, that um, the mice with the least protein survived the longest, or, or they didn't develop the cancers. And so they, they thought, well, that's kind of funny. And so they tried different kinds of protein then. And eventually this led to the particular study I'm going to tell you about. Um, and they have replicated this study time and time again. So what they did, they had um, two groups of mice. They had group A and group B. And group A, they fed uh, uh, animal protein. They gave them casein. And group B, they fed plant protein and no animal protein. And then they injected all of the little mice in both groups with a carcinogen. All of the mice, and by the way, it was the same amount of protein in grains. So all of the little mice in that had the uh, animal protein, the casein, developed cancer. All of the little mice who had the plant protein did not develop cancer. And they thought, well, that's strange. And so in the middle of the experiment, they switched groups. And so then they started giving to A, they started giving them the plant protein, and to B, um, they started giving the animal protein. And all of the mice that were now getting the animal protein developed cancer. And all of the little mice that got the plant protein went into remission. And they could do this, and they could switch the cancer off and on by what kind of protein they fed the animal. In this country, we, um, most Americans, eat twice as much protein as is needed by the body. And when protein comes into the body, and we have more than we need, and we don't use it up, then it turns to fat in the body. So, um, so we need protein. I mean, we need it for growth. We need it for repair and so forth. But we don't need too much of it. And, um, and so most people get way too much protein. But it depends on how, it depends on the source of protein. Because they could take these little mice and they could give them a whole bunch of plant protein and they were fine. But too much animal protein and they weren't, or even with some. Well, um, I read that book, and I, it changed my life. I became a vegetarian <laughs> after reading that, uh, because that's not the only study in the book. Uh, it goes on to talk about diabetes. It talks about um, heart disease, arthritis, the major diseases. And for all of the diseases, when the animals had plant-based foods, they were healthier, and they did not um, develop or continue to develop the diseases that were there. So um, that's the China study. Another book is Anti-Cancer. And, and I, I should mention, too, as a disclaimer, that, you know, uh, that's not to say that a person who eats a plant-based or a vegetarian diet will never develop cancer. There are no guarantees in life. I mean, there are a lot of other things that are going on, too. But one can certainly, it appears, by, on the scientific evidence, reduce the risk. So this book, Anti-Cancer, was written by David Servan Scribner, who is a medical doctor and a neuroscientist. And he and two of his uh, friends, who are also neuroscientists, were doing some experiments they um, were scanning the brain of uh, volunteers, and then they would give them something to look at and scan the brain again and see where the activity was in the brain. They were doing this for a research study, and one day one of the volunteers didn't show up. And so um, his two buddies said, well, you know, why don't you just jump in there and we'll scan your brain, you can be the volunteer for this. He said, okay. So he jumped in, they put him in a little machine, it scanned his brain, 
And he was waiting for them to come out and say, okay, we're ready for the look at this and see what happens. And they came out and they said, you know, um, it just didn't work right. We're going to scan your brain again. They said, okay. So they scanned his brain again, and then they came back in, and they said, there's something wrong. And they said, there's, there appears to be a dark mass in your brain. And so he went to um, the doctor then, the next day, and made an appointment, got a checkup, and he had brain cancer. And he had a tumor in his brain. And so he went through all the things. He had surgery, and, and uh, I'm, I can't remember, but I think he had chemo, maybe radiology, also, uh, radiation. And so um, anyway, got rid of the cancer, and it was about six years, and went on with his life, and about six years later, he was in remission, and he had, I mean, he, he uh, developed um, uh, another cancer, another brain cancer. And so he again had the surgery and so forth. But at that time, he was saying to himself, well, what can I do to minimize my risk of this? And he would ask doctors and whoever he came in contact, and the doctors would always say, just be sure you have enough food to maintain your energy and that. It's good to eat enough food. We don't care what it is, eat enough food. And so he thought that was kind of interesting, but remember he's a medical doctor, a neuroscientist. He was studying to be a psychologist, psych psychiatrist, um, and um, so he had a lot of um, knowledge about science, and, and so he delved into all the things that were done, all, all of the um, research studies that he could find related to cancer and the impact of food on cancer. I'm going to try to share with you a couple of things from that. Now, I, these are words that are not, they don't come tripping off my tongue. So, um, <laughs> NK cells. NK cells are special cells of the immune system. And they do not need previous exposure to disease agents to recognize and attack invaders like bacteria, viruses, or new cancer cells. So sometimes we get uh, an inoculation. We get a shot of something, and then our body recognizes it later on and says we don't want any more of you. Well, these cells, you don't have to get a shot. They're there to sort of attack things um, that are foreign to the body anyway. Um, what they do, they send out chemicals that destroy the nucleus of cancer cells uh, or invading cells in the body. And these are very important. The NK cells are very important to counter the growth of tumors. Um, to, uh, to maintain these cells and keep them at their healthiest, what he found was that they need um, their plants, they need their greens, they need their vegetables and so forth for these cells to maintain their health, to help kill, kill cancer cells. Um, another non-tripping word here is NF kappa B, and this stands for nuclear factor kappa B. Uh, the growth and spread of cancer relies on a pro-inflammatory factor secreted by cancer cells, and that's what NF-kappa B is. Without this factor, tumors become more fragile and more easily destroyed. Blocking the cancer cells' production of NF-kappa B makes them able to be controlled or destroyed. Pharmaceutical companies are looking for drugs to develop that will work in this way but they haven't, there, there aren't any real effective ones at this point. But there are foods that do this, and one of the foods is green tea. And so he even uh, found out, well, how much green tea do you need every day to be able to do this? And um, you, you need three cups of green tea a day. And um, so, okay. Here's another big word, apoptosis. I don't know if you've ever heard of this word before or not, but apoptosis is the suicide of cells. Now, in our systems, there are some rules for cells, and one is that um, reproduction of cells is not permitted except in order to replace a dead or damaged cell. And so that's sort of a standard thing, that um, 
in our bodies, cells are supposed to just reproduce again and again and again and again without a purpose. And staying alive is, uh, of a cell is not permitted if damage is detected in the structure of the cell, particularly at the DNA level. And if the damage is too great, suicide is mandatory of the cell. So that's what our system says to our cells. And so it's a way of our system staying in check. And what happens with, um, with uh, cancer is that it um, ignores these rules. And instead of not duplicating, it goes right ahead and duplicates and so forth. And it's not supposed to do that. Another thing about cancer is that when there are uh, cancer, um, when it starts creating these new cells, it needs food for the cells and waste products to be taken away. And so it sends out these little messengers saying, we need more blood vessels over here. And so blood vessels start developing and going to the tumor, to the cancer cells, and allowing it to reproduce and reproduce. And this is known as angiogenesis. And angio means vessel, and genesis, birth. And so it's new blood vessels. Um, they're working on drugs uh, also for this, things that would limit these blood vessels from going to the cancer cells. Because if you can cut off the supply to the cancer cells, then they can't develop and grow as a tumor. So, uh, but right now, um, there are a lot of complications with that as far as drugs go. However, there are some foods that do this type of thing. And one of the foods is green tea, again. And another one is mushrooms. And another one is uh, spices, especially spices like uh, turmeric. And I just brought a little along tonight to show you, but just the common household thing like that, turmeric. And, um, and other herbs also, but those are some of the major ones. So what he ended up saying was, this is sort of the anti-cancer plate that the author um, of the anti-cancer book came up with. And basically there are grains and fruits and vegetables, herbs and spices, <coughs> and so forth. And he also has on there some fish um, and, and so forth. But as you can see, lots and lots of plant foods there. Okay, another book is Eat to Live. And one of the things in this book is that um, it's not, not all about heredity. Like some people will think that because there's been a lot of cancer in my family or something like that, or maybe I have even uh, genes that are prone to developing cancer and so forth, that it's not all about heredity. Um, individuals can do things to modify their genes and the way those genes are expressed. And um, in this book, um, the author, uh, Dr. Joel Furman, who's a medical doctor, um, he talks about uh, the micronutrients, the vitamins and minerals, and the phytochemicals, and that having an adequate amount of those can actually alter the gene expression and make, it, make, uh, things, make your body healthier. Insulin growth factor one. Um, insulin growth fa factor one, lower is better. And um, a lower insulin growth fa factor one protects against cancer. This has to do with inflammation in the body and cancers grow better where there's inflammation. So if there's decreased inflammation in the system, uh, there is decreased inf inflammation in the system when the IGF-1 is lower. Um, there's more stress resistance, there's more insulin sensitivity, it slows the aging brain and it tends to increase the lifespan. The key determinant for IGF-1 levels is protein. And excess protein um, causes the IGF-1 to raise. So again, too much protein sounds like not a really good, good thing. <coughs> Excuse me. 
Another thing he talks about is in the 1940s. Yeah. Does it matter where the protein comes from? Um, in that one, um, if he said, I don't remember. And, yeah. So I think just in general, protein, too much of that. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, and in the 1940s, um, that's when the vitamin supplements started being developed, that a lot of the vitamins uh, were just discovered around this time. I think 1910 might have been the first year that vitamins were even discovered. And so around the 1940s, they said, you know, we can make vitamin supplements. And they started developing vitamin supplements. And around that time, too, we were getting a lot more um, processed foods and so forth. But cancer rates skyrocketed. And part of the reason that the author, and he laid out a pretty good argument, which I can't remember, but part of the reason that he said this was happening was because they isolated the vitamins. And what they didn't um, account for is all the phytochemicals in the foods that are really important. So it's really important to eat the foods and not depend on supplements. And in fact, some supplements um, can actually cause cancers to grow more. Um, so one needs to kind of be careful about some of those things. Um, mushrooms. Um, mushrooms contain, again, these are words tripping off my tongue here, aromatase inhibitors. And they prevent the body from, um, uh, from making too much estrogen which can lead to breast cancer. Mushrooms also contain antigen-binding leptins, which encourage apoptosis. So it encourages those cells to die. We mentioned that before. If they're trying to grow too much, like a little tumor, mushrooms help to keep them in check. Uh, mushrooms also contain an angiogenesis inhibitors, um, which prevent abnormal cells uh, like in cancer, from obtaining blood to the tumor so that they can grow. So again, that's sort of the second book that talks about those same things. Um, onions. Um, he talked about some studies that were done, and the highest consumers of onions, as compared to those people who don't eat onions, the highest consumers of onions have a reduction of 56% of colon cancer a reduction of 73% ovarian cancer, 88% esophageal cancer, 71% prostate cancer, and 50% stomach cancer. So onions and uh, things in that family, garlic and so forth, those are good things to be eating. So we need to live, what he says that one should eat, he has a six-week plan. And basically what he, he's been a medical doctor for years and years and has worked with lots and lots of patients. And being overweight or obese is at the heart of a lot of diseases and conditions. So he typically would put people on this six-week plan. And so unlimited foods, what they can eat on a six-week plan, um, eat as much as you want of raw vegetables or cooked greens and non-green nutrient-rich vegetables. Non-green nutrient-rich vegetables are eggplant, mushrooms, peppers, onions, tomatoes, carrots, and cauliflower. Um, beans, legumes, bean sprouts, and tofu, about one cup daily, and fresh fruit, uh, at least four daily. The limited things on the diet would be cooked starchy vegetables or whole grains. And then raw nuts and seeds, one ounce maximum per day and avocado, two ounces maximum, dried fruit, and ground flaxseed. And off limits completely are dairy products, animal products, um, between meal snacks of any kind, fruit juice, and oils. Why is fruit juice often? Too sugary. Mm -hmm. yeah. too, too concentrated with, um, and you don't get any benefits of the fiber in the fruit when it's in, in the juice. So he said there's 10 easy steps. Um, remember the salad is the main dish. Eat it first at lunch and dinner. Eat as much fruit as you want, but at least four fresh fruits daily. Variety is the spice of life, life, particularly when it comes to greens. 
Beware of the starchy vegetable. Eat beans every day. Eliminate animal and dairy products. Have a tablespoonful of ground flax seed every day. Consume nuts and seeds in limited amounts, not more than one ounce per day. Eat lots of mushrooms all the time. <laughs> and keep it simple. And by the way, he makes a point, too, of saying that really, all you really need to uh, a day of mushrooms is just one mushroom. Basically, what would be you know, one uh, about as big as that part of your finger. You just need one mushroom a day. But you can have as many as you want. Okay. Um, and part of his premise uh, in losing weight is the idea that on the right hand side, that's 400 calories of spinach, eggplant, and beans. Takes up the whole stomach. And then in the middle, that's 400 calories of chicken and 400 calories of oil there on the left. So it just makes a lot of sense if you're eating more plant-based products that one feels fuller and doesn't uh, have that craving to eat again and again. And then uh, this is his food guide pyramid with vegetables on the bottom, half raw, half cooked, and maybe 50%, he says 30 to 60% of calories. And then on the next level is fruits, and then beans and legumes, and then seeds, nuts, avocados, whole grains and potatoes, uh, poultry, oil, eggs, fish, and fat-free dairy, and I can't read what it says under there. And, um, and then at the top there's beef and sweets and cheese and so forth. Now, it's not that you should have those things, but one of the things that I do like about Dr. Furman's uh, diet plan is after the first six weeks, uh, there's no animal products at all in the first six weeks. But after that, he said 10% of one's calories, and this isn't 10% by volume, but it's 10% of calories can come from anything. But 90% but of the calories must come from these other plant-based foods. And then in every chapter in the book, he has some pictures of people that have um, gone on the program and lost weight. And this, this is a man who became, a, I think, a marathon runner. And then um, this woman, um, she lost 100 pounds. And I, I don't think I can read what she wrote there, but I love how she, she said it. She said she, uh, I don't know, her son got sick and had to go to the hospital. She stuck with the plan. She followed the plan. And other things happened, and she had to go to another city. She followed the plan. Another thing happened, she followed the plan. And she just followed that plan all the way through. And here, I don't know how long it was, but um, she was 100 pounds lighter and feeling just so much better. But even in the midst of all the hardship she went through, she followed the plan, and it paid off. And then um, this book, um, Preventing and, or prevent and reverse heart disease. And this is by Caldwell Esselstyn, Jr., a medical doctor. And years ago, um, I'm going to say in the early 90s, but it might have been further back than that, he believed that people could reverse heart disease. The, the medical establishment did not believe that, and they also did not believe that anyone would be willing to go on an extreme diet that it would take to reverse heart disease. So if there was a heart disease patient that had no alternatives, they, they really couldn't do surgery and they couldn't do this and that and whatever, they would refer them to Dr. Esselstyn. And so he started working with these people and would present to them, uh, and he set up a study, and there were, I forget how many people were in the study, not a whole lot, but let's say 20, some or 30, uh, were in the study. And if they were willing to do this, then um, he would work with them. And so he put them on a very, very strict diet. Um, there were absolutely no oils. There were, were absolutely no animal products of any sort. Um, no... <coughs> non-whole grain anything, and so forth. But he has had marvelous results. And basically, um, almost all of the people who were on that, um, that diet recovered 
from heart disease, even though they were the worst of the worst. Mm -hmm. And this next picture will show you, here is a coronary artery before and after consuming a plant-based diet. This mm -hmm. picture is actually from the China study, but it is, <coughs> it's everywhere, you can find this picture, but mm -hmm. it just shows how that coronary artery repaired itself when it had the right fuel to be able to do that. So, a diet to enhance our health. Hippocrates, around 400 BC, said, let food be thy medicine and medicine be thy food. One of the famous quotes we hear. So, foods which one might want to eat based on the research, uh, plants, of course, uh, G-bombs. Uh, G-bombs are, G stands for greens. So, lettuce and arugula and broccoli and kale and all of those things. B is for beans. O is for onions, M is for mushrooms, B is for berries, and S is for seeds. So, G-bombs, a good, good way to think about what foods should we be eating. And then spices, spices are very good. I mentioned uh, turmeric before, um, also ginger. Um, Cinnamon. What was it? Cinnamon. Cinnamon, Cinnamon. yes, yeah. And obviously green tea. And then foods to not eat, uh, processed foods. Processed foods have just uh, a lot of things, especially they have a lot of salt, they probably have sugars and uh, all sorts of other things that most of us can't pronounce. And also uh, animal products, or if one is eating animal products, it should probably be the side or 10% of calories one eats. And uh, sugars, sugars add to the inflammation in one's system and sugars promote a lot of things. Sugars promote cancer. Um, sugars promote uh, arthritis, uh, diabetes, weight gain. So, names for this particular diet, depending upon who the author is, um, there are a variety of names. Some people call it plant-based. Some people call it starch-based. Some people call it vegetarian or vegan. And Dr. Joel Furman, that I talked about a bit ago, uh, he calls it nutritarian, that it's basically based on the nutrients in the foods and um, so forth. And why don't we know this? Um, basically, doctors don't know this. Most doctors have maybe one um, nutrition course during their studies to be a doctor. And in that one, they learn the nutrients are carbohydrate, fat, protein, vitamins, minerals, and water. And they learn what the function is and what the deficiency diseases are. And that's basically what the beginning um, nutrition course is and what doctors know. Um, there's no drug company supporting this type of a diet. When there's something that comes up about um, a way to prevent cancers, for example, the, the drug companies look for a drug to do it. Mm -hmm. Nobody's promoting the food to do it. Mm -hmm. And in fact, in one of these books, um, one of the, and I forget which one, but this, this, um, this man was excited because he had found that turmeric in the lab, when they would inject a carcinogen and whatever, that they could keep that tumor from developing by using turmeric. And he went to somebody saying, oh, look, you know, we can do this, and so forth, and all it is is turmeric. And they said, oh, well, never mind. So. so he thought he had to have a different way to, to uh, do this. And so he, he did a, a research study, and he had the results of it, but he didn't ever say what it was. And he presented this, and everybody was, wow, you know, we've... What drug is this? We've got to get on board with this. And he said, it's not a drug. It's turmeric. And they said, oh. Because who's going to push it? You know, uh, There's no money to be made in promoting fruits and vegetables. So the conclusion. Food and stress and exercise all impact our health. Hopefully we can prevent those plane crashes rather than using drugs and surgery to treat. And we're all in this together. 
Um, I'm curious what you all, um, you've had experiences, you have thoughts about some of these things, or um, so open it up for ideas. I have a question. Early in your presentation, there was a plate of healthy food, which was fruit and vegetables, yada, yada. And then also there was fish. You said you can eat limited amount of fish. Is there a type of fish that is better than other fish? Some fish you should avoid? Mostly they say um, fish like tilapia. I can't remember the other things, but uh, salmons would be another one that's usually considered pretty good. And the reason for that is that they have omega-3s. Um, now, people who say don't eat meat and don't eat fish, um, flaxseed has omega-3. And so those, those people would say use flaxseed instead of fish to get your omega-3s. We need a... Um, the ratio of omega-3s to omega-6s should be about one to one. And in our society today, I can't remember exactly, but we're way high on the omega-6s and low on the omega-3s. So they use omega-3s a lot of times in marketing, but you don't have to get some special project. Flaxseed has the omega-3s. What is omega-6? I'm sorry? What is omega-6? Omega-6 is in a lot of different things. It's in like um, a lot of... Salad oils, vegetable oils. Is that right, Terry? Terry is the consultant tonight as a registered dietitian in the room. <laughs> I asked her if she would come tonight in case there were questions that I can't answer. I'm back here. Absolutely. You can't see me. Uh, when you say not uh, animal food, what about uh, dairy? What about dry, uh, what about uh, skim milk and yogurt that doesn't have fat in it? Because you have to have calcium. Yeah, actually, um, the skim milk or one or two percent, it, it, it's not the fat in it that is the problem. It's the casing. And so dairy products, especially cheese, cheese is so concentrated, but milk, yogurt, any of those things um, do not promote health. Do not promote health. health. But how do you get enough calcium? Well, there's calcium in a lot of vegetables. There's calcium in spinach. There's calcium in broccoli. Um, so, yeah. Almond milk. Almond milk. Yeah. And so a lot of people who don't use um, uh, milk that you might buy at the store actually use almond milk or there's soy milk, uh, rice milk. There's a lot of different milks that one can get. And they have calcium? Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. okay. I might just throw out one other thing too that you know everybody's so concerned about protein and a lot of times people say where do you get your protein if you don't have milk or whatever you know and or meat and actually every living thing has protein in it we couldn't build any cells or repair any cells if if we didn't have protein because protein that's what it does and so uh, most all vegetables have some degree of protein in it. And uh, beans, lentils, those have plenty of protein. So it is not hard to get protein. And there has not been one documented case of protein deficiency in the United States. The only time people are pro deficient in protein is when they are not getting enough food at all. And they're like hungry then there might be a protein deficiency. But people are so, and people add protein to everything, you know, thinking, oh, I've got to have enough protein. And probably that's just the opposite of what we ought to be doing. How, how many grams of protein do they suggest you get a day for adults? It depends on one's size and so forth. I'm going to throw this to the dietitian. <laughs> it, I mean, the technical answer is 0.8 grams per kilogram of body weight. But um, it's somewhere between uh, if you get between 20 and 40 per meal, if you eat three meals a day, it ends up about 60 to 80 grams a day. Oh, so, oh that's quite a bit. 60 uh, to 80. Yeah. Well, a gram or uh, a piece of uh, like three ounces of chicken, that, which is the size of the deck of cards actually, um, is about <laughs> that's about 27 grams of protein right there. But so if we don't eat the meat and chicken. Yeah. Oh, if uh, because there are couple different of, kinds of protein. There's right. different. You need, you know, there are amino acids, and there's mm -hmm. yeah a lot of different kinds. You have to have a balance of those. Right, and most cut like and a cup of giant have. beans, like kidney beans or fava beans or northern beans. A cup of those has about 21 grams of protein. 
So if you get, um, you, if you like a lot of beans, <laughs> but it's not, it, it's, it's not too difficult. And quite honestly, your stomach can't really process more than 35 grams of protein at a time. So people that are doing all those protein shakes, and they, they actually, it just, a lot of it just gets turned into adipose tissue because it's extra calories versus extra protein. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. Other thoughts? Are, I'm going to ask Anna Mae what she thinks about this particular um, Well, the one thing I thought of, they said no oils, but I was thinking, doesn't oils transfer nutrients to your body? Because it's a fat. And I, I think that's on the one on the six weeks diet. Uh, for people that are greatly overweight. Mm -hmm. But, um, yeah, people are usually encouraged to have some uh, fats or oils in their diet. And not to go overboard, but, yeah. you know, yeah, you can. Yeah. But I was just going to mention, um, I don't know if anybody's ever heard of the Black Hills um, Health and Education Center. It's in Hermosa, South Dakota. And they um, do kind of like a six-week program there. People go in with arthritis, heart disease, cancers, and they're there for, they can be there anywhere from like six to eight weeks, or some people go there for just a couple weeks at a time, and they put them on a plant-based diet, and they leave there, like sometimes they're almost cured from their, like their condition they went in there with, so, and that's not that far from here, so, and they're very open to have people come check it out, so if you're ever interested in learning more about it, you can go there, and they're, they focus on holistic health, they do massages, and lemon wraps, and Lots of interesting things. So. Thanks. Any other questions? I, I was kind of curious. Like, with the green tea, is that because it's like an antioxidant and stimulant? Like, why is it so promoted throughout your? Yeah. Um, green tea has properties that like black tea doesn't, because black tea is more refined, and the green tea. Um, I don't know, it, it's not the antioxidants specifically, but green tea has some other characteristics to it that um, keep the body, um, keep cancers from developing, that shut off the blood supply to cancers and so forth. And I don't know what the specific thing is in it that does that. But it, yeah. Does that answer your question? I was just wondering why it was so, because um, like water is cleansing too, and that helps kind of circulate and digest and stuff like that. Yeah, and water is important. I know that you, you're very big on drinking that one. Um, but it's it's not that part of it. It's some of the properties that, that the green tea has, and I don't know specifically what those are. Any questions? Well, thank you. You're very, very welcome.